So hello and a very warm welcome to today's iCentury Connect session. I'm Marianne Comparet and I'm speaking from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases, uh, tuning in for this session from London in the UK. It's my greatest pleasure to welcome you all to today's session. Uh, we have a wonderful, very international audience once again, so big hello to all. And um, over the next 90 minutes, we're going to be taking a, a closer look at how to improve and strengthen NTD detection, management and reporting in resourceful settings. And more particularly, how digital diagnostics have a major part to play in accelerating this. Uh, now, I think many of you will remember that we've had the pleasure and in fact, the honor of hearing all about the very exciting work of the numerous partners in the Digital Diagnostics for Africa network in this field. Um, at this point, I'd like to invite all of those who perhaps didn't catch those sessions to go onto our YouTube channel and hear all about this multidisciplinary, um, in fact, what we might even call game-changing um, research in this field. Um, and we'll be posting the links to that in the chat very shortly. Um, but for now, for those working in public health, um, there's always this age-old balancing act between, on the one hand, the breakthroughs offered by beautiful science and this sort of groundbreaking technology, and on the other hand, the realistic prospect of impact, which really comes down to if and how these innovations will be integrated into healthcare systems, especially at primary level, as well as adopted by the communities themselves. Um, so in this session, we're going to be discussing a really important aspect related to um, implementing interventions and diagnostics, which is engagement with key stakeholders and communities to ensure, to ensure that the needs and priorities of these different types of users and stakeholders are central and in fact embedded right into the development process. And so to better understand and unpack um, this entire co-development process, it's my pleasure today to welcome our panelists who will be sharing their insights from uh, case studies, both from Ethiopia and South Sudan. And so first and foremost, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Laura Donovan, Senior Research Officer at Malaria Consortium. Hello, Laura. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Laura, you are working on a team with Dr. Kevin Baker. Dr. Kevin Baker, you are a senior research specialist at the Malaria Consortium as well and a principal investigator on the work and the projects that Laura uh, will be describing. So welcome. Thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for the opportunity to present. It's great to be here. Thank you. I guess you're both joining from London as well. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Super. And then uh, after your presentation, uh, we'll have uh, the pleasure of hearing from uh, Professor Salome Bukachi. Hello, Professor Salome. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thanks for joining us. And uh, you will be, you are Associate Professor at the Institute of Anthropology, Gender and Africa Studies, and you're joining us from the University of Nairobi. So thank you very much and a warm welcome to you as well. Thank you. Fantastic. So without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to Laura. Uh, Kevin, I believe you'll be joining us later on for the Q&A and our discussion. And uh, to a lovely audience, I think you're quite used to it now, but all your questions and your comments, any discussions you'd like, uh, any topics you'd like to expand on, please don't hesitate to put these in the chat. And uh, we'll, we'll regroup in a few moments from now. But for the time being, um, I hand over to you, Laura. Yep. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here again. Um, so for my presentation, um, I'll be presenting on a project we're currently doing in Ethiopia. So it's called Improving NTD Services and Integration into Primary Healthcare in Southern Nations, Nationalities and Peoples Region, or SNNPR in Ethiopia. Um, so just to give a, a bit of background on the project, so I guess um, most of you probably know that NTDs are a group of parasitic and bacterial infectious diseases that affect more than 1.5 billion of the world's population. 
Um, over 40% of the global NTD burden is in sub-Saharan Africa, with Ethiopia having one of the highest burdens in Africa. Um, however, NTDs were not really given the required attention until recently. So the Federal Ministry of Health in Ethiopia has identified eight endemic priority NTDs, including trachoma, uh, schistosomiasis, lymphatic filariasis, and podocon podoconiosis, that's a tongue twister. Um, and those four diseases are the focus of our project. Um, and also data on burden and distribution are often incomplete and not updated on a daily ba or a timely basis and access to services are inadequate. Um, so in terms of why, why we're doing this project, so, so far NTD control has really only focused on developing and distributing safe and effective drugs, uh, mainly through mass drug administration or MDA. Um, however, the WHO's uh, roadmap for 2021 to 2030 calls for greater integration and mainstreaming of NTD approaches into national health systems. And also Ethiopia's um, NTD master plan has listed integration of NTDs into its primary healthcare system as a key strategic objective. Um, so just to run you through the aims and objectives of the study. So um, the aim is to develop and pilot an intervention to strengthen the implementation of NTD detection, management and reporting in primary health care in Ethiopia. So we're doing the study in um, Damok Gale district in Waleta zone. And we chose this area um, due to the endemicity of the target NTDs and also kind of the logistical and operational feasibility and accessibility. So the first objective um, is to identify current gaps in the Ethiopian primary healthcare system for implementing integrated NTD services. And we did this through um, three different methods. So we did a situation analysis, a health system capacity assessment, and we also did um, qualitative research through key informant interviews. Um, and I'll go into each of these methods a little more on the next slide, but this was the formative part of the project. The second objective is to develop intervention materials and processes that address the current gaps in the primary healthcare system for implementing integrated NTD services. And that's part of the, the second intervention phase. And then finally, um, to pilot test the intervention in selected health facilities for five months. And we want to evaluate feasibility, acceptability, and implementation cost. So um, going through the methods. So as I said, the first part was to do a situation analysis. Um, and the aim of this was basically to provide an overview of current prevention detection, management, and reporting processes, identify any gaps, and then help us think about how we might want to fill or improve those gaps. So we did a desk-based mapping and review of current materials on these different processes. So we review things like national NTD guidelines, manuals, job aids, and brochures. The second part was a health system capacity assessment and this was a um, kind of a, a structured questionnaire that we had on a digital platform called Comcare. And we went into um, one primary hospital, one health center and five health posts within the district. And within this questionnaire, we asked um, questions on staff training. So availability of manuals and job aids, um, information and reporting system. So how they log their data and how often. HR, so um, how many staff, what kinds of staff, drugs, equipment, supplies, and um, general kind of service delivery gaps. Um, and then finally, we did um, a bunch of key informant interviews, both at the community level and the stakeholder level. So we did 22 at the community level, um, 12 with community members, both with and without disability caused by an NTD. Um, with five health extension workers and also 
five health development army members. And just to give a bit of um, a bit of background, so in Ethiopia, a health extension worker, um, they're located at health posts and in the community, and they provide basic health education. Also, they assist with immunization. Um, and you have two health extension workers per kabel, um, which is the lowest um, or the smallest administrative unit in Ethiopia. And it has around a thousand households. Um, and then the health development army, these are they're similar to community health workers, but they're not formally integrated within the health system and their work is often seasonal. Um, okay, so in terms of the results, um, I'll go through them one by one and I won't break it down by the four diseases because that would take a very long time. So I'll just summarize the cross-cutting gaps. So we found through our review that um, there are no available job aids at the primary hospital, health center or health post level to support healthcare workers in decision making. There was also an absence of clear harmonized case definitions for both suspected and confirmed NTDs. And these are really important to ensure adherence to good practice and consistent quality of service delivery. We also found that staff roles and responsibilities and referral mechanisms were not clearly outlined for things like early detection, uh, clinical and laboratory confirmation of disease and case management. Um, also, staff were not able to address suspected NTD cases in the absence of diagnostics or laboratory facilities to confirm disease. And finally, uh, recording and reporting tools for targeted NTDs um, were, were available and integrated with the um, national manic sorry, National Health Management Information System, but were not always used. So it seemed that a lot of the, um, the processes and the systems were manual and were not being used as effectively as they could be. So this is where we really see a big gap for um, automated or digital diagnostics to play a key part in helping this. Um, in terms of the health system capacity assessment, so when we physically went in and surveyed the different um, health facilities, we found there was a significant lack of manpower um, and most staff were inadequately trained on NTDs or they were only trained on one or two. There was also um, poor infrastructure and a lack of essential diagnostics, drugs and medical supplies um, for NTD treatment and management. Uh, however, most health facilities did have an adequate electricity and water supply. Um, there was also a lack of sensitive diagnostics like the circulating cathodic antigen and cat or cats tests for detection of uh, schistosomiasis. And we actually found that in the study hospital and the health center, they were using direct microscopy, which is a bit less sensitive. Um, so again, this is where digital diagnostics could come in and, and play a really key role. There were also limited NTD guidelines, training manuals and SBCC, social behavior change um, materials. And finally, staff were not supervised um, as well as they could be. So finally, um, the results from the key informant interview. So in this presentation, I'm only summarizing the stakeholder interviews as I feel this is a bit more relevant to the whole digital diagnostics theme, um, whereas the community level findings are more to do with awareness and perceptions of NTDs, which is perhaps not so relevant here. Um, so we found that HMIS data uh, were not used for planning and decision making, and that planning was not conducted in a scientific manner. So there was a, a real lack of data on the catchment population of that health facility, local disease prevalence. Um, there were also a number of challenges related to service delivery, mainly a high staff turnover, lack of leadership, political instability in the area, um, a lack of community awareness, and also a lack of empowerment among healthcare staff. So even if staff um, knew how to say, 
uh, diagnose or manage a disease, they didn't feel empowered or confident enough to do so. So the stakeholders suggested a, a number of different things to improve this, um, one of them being capacity building training for staff and providing clearer NTD case definitions, job aids and guidelines, um, and improving community awareness of NTDs. So that was service delivery. And in terms of um, the integration of NTD services, there were also quite a few challenges, mainly around, um, again, community and staff lack of awareness or knowledge um, and insufficient resources. So namely drugs, diagnostic equipment and manpower. And um, just to break these down into five main areas. So uh, data reporting and HMIS, referral and follow up lack of staff willingness, um, which is linked to a lack of empowerment and knowledge, and then finally a lack of resources, um, including diagnostics. So using the um, our formative findings, we came up with a multi-component intervention based on these. Um, this is not the entire intervention, I'm just um, taking the, the main parts of it. So clearly outlining roles and responsibilities at different levels of the primary healthcare system, creating clear harmonized case definitions based on disease signs and symptoms, um, adding indicators for suspected NTD cases, which are perhaps not confirmed by clinical or by laboratory examination, um, providing basic drugs and medical supplies, um, particularly improved diagnostics for uh, schistosomiasis, um, and then finally, providing SBCC materials to enhance awareness of the targeted NTDs. So this multi-component intervention is currently being um, piloted in selected health facilities for four to five months. And um, in October this year, we will have a evaluation of the intervention, including its uh, acceptability, feasibility and cost. Um, and we we feel that this could perhaps provide some valuable feedback um, about incorporating uh, digital diagnostics such as the lacewing technology. Um, and then kind of just to summarize and bring it back to the theme of this. So there were huge gaps in uh, NTD diagnosis. So we saw a, a clear widespread um, lack of case definitions for suspected and confirmed NTDs, and also the infrastructure to confirm disease, so laboratory facilities and real sensitive detection tools. So we feel that digital diagnostics really holds significant potential to enhance both the speed and accuracy of diagnoses, but perhaps also provide a more cost effective um, method in the long term. Um, so I think that's it. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening and we would welcome any questions you have. Thank you very, very much, Laura, for, for setting this scene. Um, that's really useful, but also hugely important given the, um, the amazing potential that digital diagnostics could have in, in really taking massive leaps in terms of improving diagnosis, but then at the same time, uh, making sure that that really is embedded into existing infrastructure uh, or, or even lack of infrastructure as you've unpacked as part of your many, uh, the challenges you've uh, pointed out there. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, before we move on to the Q&A and the discussion, I'm just going to hand the floor over to Salome. Uh, Professor, you're going to give us uh, some more insights, looking, focusing a bit more on uh, human African trypanosomiasis in South Sudan and um, how those findings and those um, your, your observations on knowledge, attitudes and practices can really uh, help to design intervention strategies. So Salome, I hand the floor over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you and uh, greetings to everyone again. Uh, my presentation will be looking at uh, the knowledge, attitudes and practices about human African trypanosomiasis and the implications in designing intervention strategies. Uh, for Yei County in South Sudan. 
And uh, this is a study that was being done under the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics um, with, uh, together with the Ministry of Health in uh, South Sudan and an organization, an NGO known as Maltisa International. So this is part of a project that was looking at an intensified aspects of incorporating um, uh, uh, innovative techniques, diagnostic techniques into the community. So I'll start by just giving a background of the disease that we're working in for those who may not have some background about it. So human African trypanosomiasis, it's also known as sleeping sickness, and it's a parasitic uh, neglected tropical disease that's transmitted by sessiflies. And it's uh, currently, um, it, it's been uh, domiciled in the sub-Saharan Africa. It presents with febrile symptoms similar to uh, what we have as malaria, but in the it, it presents in two stages. The first stage is more you get the febrile illness. In the second stage, when the, uh, the parasites have crossed into um, the central nervous system, then we, uh, we see symptoms such as sleep and behavior disorders, which then means that the disease has gotten into the late stage. So control for the disease can be done passively or actively uh, through passive or active screening. Uh, passive screening whereby when um, uh, people go to the hospital, the disease could be picked out when they're in the health facility or active screening where teams that are specialized in um, diagnosing the disease go to the community and actively um, test the people to see whether they could be having the disease. Uh, in, in, in addition to that, uh, there's also vector control as a way of controlling the disease through controlling the sesame flies and the various methods that are being used uh, to uh, and, 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 and engage in vector control. So there's the potential for screening for, um, uh, just to mention that there are two types of the disease. There's the one which is called Gabiense, human African trypanosomiasis, which has been more confined to the West African side, Uganda and West African side. Then there's the Rhodes Rhodesiense, human African trypanosomiasis, which is more confined in the East Africa, uh, a bit of the Southern part of Africa. So this potential for screening for uh, the Gabiense, I'll, for these purposes of this presentation, I'll be talking about the Gabiense type of human African trypanosomiasis. Um, this potential for screening in health facilities and this has been improved with the recent development of the rapid diagnostic tests. So um, just a visualization of how um, the, the, the new innovative uh, diagnostic uh, uh, aspect works. Um, the uh, rapid diagnostic kits are available at health facilities, which do not require the health facilities to have um, uh, quite electricity and improved infrastructure, it can work in a basic health facility. And that's one of the, the plus sides of this RGT because it brings the diagnosis down to the lower levels at the primary healthcare level. And so once somebody at the primary healthcare level goes and has symptoms that are suggestive of the disease, including persistent fever, and especially after being treated for malaria and it's not um, uh, getting uh, treated, then there are a possible suspect to be treated, uh, to be tested for human African trypanosomiasis. So they are uh, tested using the RDT kit. If they are positive, they are referred to a parasitological facility which has now more improved facilities and their parasitological test is done. And if they are found positive, they are considered a case. And uh, they, are, they are tested now to find out at which stage of the disease they are. But there's also then the uh, incorporation of uh, uh, a motorcycle, which can take the results quickly to another facility, a lump uh, treatment facility, where then they are tested uh, to be found if they're a strong suspect. And if they're a strong suspect, through the use of an SMS or a written result slip, the results are referred back to the parasitological facility and referred back to the health facility where the person initially tested. And they're now told that they need to be referred for further treatment. So the process, um, that's how the process of that diagnostic, diagnostic works. 
So um, my field is more on the medical anthropology side, which I'm more of an expert in. And so I will, I will now take us through the formative stage of research uh, that we took into consideration before uh, to improve on the implementation and uptake of the new diagnostic methods. So the new screening and diagnostic tool strategies were introduced into South Sudan as part of the integrated delivery of primary health care. But one of the things we know is that knowledge and awareness on human African trypanosomiasis and its improved or new screening and diagnostic tools and the places and processes of getting a confirmatory diagnosis and treatment are crucial to this strategy of improved um, control of the disease. Uh, communication is vital in health campaigns, and this helps to increase knowledge and skills and initiate the uptake of health services. So an understanding of the knowledge, attitudes and practices is necessary to improve disease surveillance and control. So through a partnership of the government of South Sudan, an NGO known as Maltisa International, the Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics and the World Health Organization, in uh, controlling sleeping sickness in South Sudan, um, they, they, they came up with this integrated strategy of controlling the disease. But we realized that there was inadequate information on the community's knowledge, attitudes, and practices to enable implement um, a strategy that would be effective. So we, we undertook a formative research which was a social survey looking at the knowledge, attitudes, and practices to provide relevant information to develop effective information, education, and communication materials. And the, and the, the second objective was to roll out a community mobilization and sensitization on the new diagnostics using the IEC materials. So our hypothesis was that even with the availability of the new diagnostics, if the community's perspectives about the disease, about its treatment and various aspects of the disease are not taken into consideration, then even these new diagnostics may not be effective in terms of controlling the disease. So uh, we collected data in five PIAMs. Those are the administrative boundaries in South Sudan and uh, did a cross-sectional survey uh, using questionnaires, uh, key informant interviews, and focused group discussions. So we use the mixed methods approach. And uh, the results uh, from the social demographics were able to pick out various aspects. And key to this was uh, that in terms of the level of education of the respondents, majority of them fell, a high majority, 58.7%, fell within the, the category of primary level education. And this has implications when we are tailoring um, education, information materials, because then we need to take that into consideration. Um, in terms of the knowledge about the disease, there were various aspects that came out. What we realized is that the community had, uh, had heard about the disease and 99% indicated they had heard about the disease, but we realized that there was some percentage of the community which had some misconceptions about the disease. And those are the mis misconceptions we can see highlighted in yellow. Much as 85, around 86% knew about the cause of the disease, but we had a, a, a percentage, 14.3%, who related the disease to various things which are not um, the correct aspects of the disease, such as mosquitoes, uh, sleeping a lot, uh, walking in dirty water, walking in the sun, as, 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 as aspects of things, um, the misconceptions that we found. In relation to prevention, use of bed nets and vaccination was being, uh, 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 by 29% of the population, were indicated that those would be the prevention methods. And places of risk for sleeping sickness, they indicated 37% indicated latrines, dirty water, cold places. And 29% said that the community's perception towards sleeping sickness patients, that they would be stigmatized. So we took into, uh, we appreciated the fact that there was a high level of um, 
uh, knowledge among the community, but our concern was these misconceptions that exist in this percentage, even if it's small, because those have the potential of negating uh, the control efforts being put in place. So it's important to take that into consideration. So um, given that this was a mixed method, some of the uh, results that were coming out from uh, the qualitative perspectives, just for uh, amplifying the voices of the community, uh, one key informant indicated that if you're diagnosed with sleeping sickness, you're considered not valuable in the society. This has implications because if that is the view that people have in the community, then they would even fear going to be tested because they don't want to be considered not valuable in the society. And within, in the focus group discussions uh, with, the, with male discussants, there was consensus among the group that if you're tested positive, your male organ will die. There's been a lot of um, um, uh, attachment to uh, male libido uh, being uh, going down as a result of having suffered, suffered from the disease. So that's a common, uh, that was a common um, perception among uh, the community uh, when we held the discussions with them. So when we look at knowledge on signs and symptoms, uh, we find that uh, there, there are common signs that are, are known for sleeping sickness and that relates to abnormal disease, behavior change, but we also saw that there are other signs which uh, were, were, were brought out by the community and this related to er erectile dysfunction, uh, memory loss, um, and aspects of also abnormal itching and rashes. So from the community's perspective, the key signs that they brought out related to abnormal sleeping, severe headache, and weight gain as key symptoms. And within the focus group discussions, the abnormal itching and rushes. So all these were information that uh, helped us now to go to the next stage, which I will discuss later. So when we look at the community uh, health seeking behavior in relation to sleeping sickness, uh, we found that um, a high majority, 86.4%, would use the government health facilities. But we realized that there was also some small percentage who use some, um, some non-conventional methods such as traditional healing, self-medication. Uh, some would just seek help from the family. Uh, in terms of uh, options, they would seek for sleeping sickness. Again, they would go to the pharmacy. They would go to a traditional healer, that is 0 0.3. Self-treatment with herbs, 0 0.2, while 97% would go to the health facility. And again, in relation to point when to seek treatment in health facilities, at, at the time in which they would seek for health care in a health facility, 50% indicated that as soon as they saw the symptoms of the disease, they would go to a health facility, while 23% said that it, they would take between three to four weeks before they would go to the health facility. 14% uh, said they would only go to the health facility after self-medication failed while 11.6% said they wouldn't go to the hospital. So those again are things that we take into consideration when we are trying to help um, uh, improve the control of the disease. And even if we're, if, if we're implementing our uh, new diagnostics, then we need to take into consideration those dissensions that exist in the community. Again, combining both, uh, using both mixed methods, we were able to also find that there are historical myths that have existed over time in the community that have implications also in terms of um, uh, how and where people seek for treatment. So one of the key informants uh, told us that if you're found positive for sleeping sickness, that is in the historical setups, you would be taken to a, a, play, a, a health facility known as Lirango in Yambio and you would be eaten by the whites. So um, in the past, when they were tested for sleeping sickness, they would be taken away because this Yambio was known as a, a sleeping sickness treatment center. So when the uh, communities were tested for sleeping sickness, they would be taken to this Yambio health facility. 
And of course, then there were meets that came around it because they would go there and stay for almost six months because the treatment regime for treating the disease at that time required hospitalization and it required you to be there for a long duration. Again, another myth that came up was that the hospital is poisoning people. If you're taken to Omugo, you will die. Of course, when you look at this more, uh, if, if you investigate further, you find that sometimes by the time somebody was being taken to the hospital, the disease had actually reached the late stage. And of course, the prognosis for the late stage was not so good. And so we'd have deaths among the community. So because this formative uh, research was about helping us to develop communica a communication strategy in the community as part of the integrated approach towards control of the disease, we needed to find out from the community the preferred information sources, where they get their information from. And uh, the three most preferred sources of information were the radio, health workers, and the village elders. We also um, sought to establish the channels and sources for information flow and uh, the effective sources and the people whom the community said would be effective sources of information were women groups, teachers or school children, the headmen or the sub chiefs, the administrators in the various um, administrative areas. As from a key informant to amplify their voices, a key informant told us that these groups mentioned are effective mobilizers. When they talk, they are trusted and respected. Without this group, you will not be accepted or listened to. After this is successful, use radios, use radios. Health education is first passed through other channels, indicating that sleeping sickness is dangerous. Then you can use radio given that everyone has a radio. Uh, we also looked at the communication channels in relation, in relation to places where then uh, information could be relayed. And uh, the effective places as per the community were market, markets or uh, church or religious places, uh, funeral places and health facilities. And from a key informant again, they said big posters with pictures are also preferred and are better at passing information than, tr than written text, and even instead of t-shirts, which would bring issues. However, talking is best because many people do not read, some even tear posters. And we relate this back to one of the social demographic that we found that most of the community had a, a, a primary level of education. So um, what now we did with the formative research with the findings from the formative research, we went to the next stage and developed uh, IEC materials uh, using the findings from the study. And we developed flip charts, which were to be used in the health facility by the community health volunteers. We developed brochures, which uh, were to be used uh, by school children in schools to be distributed in schools. And then we also developed pamphlets, which were to be used by the community health workers and household health promoters. We developed content for the radio, which had jingle announcements and drama, which were played over in various radio stations, in conveying the information and uh, passing information based on the findings that we got. And this is one of the, uh, of the IEC material that you can see in that photo. So we rolled out the communication strategy. Of course, when we developed the IC materials, we tested them first among the community and used the information we got to um, finalize and then uh, now roll it out. So we rolled out, um, we, we distributed the IC materials and used them for social mobilization, community sensitization and awareness creation. So our first stop of uh, passing information was to the community health workers and the house home health promoters, because these are the people who know the villages and, are, and have a very close relationship with the communities. So they're the first people who we trained kind of training, trainer of trainers for them to be able to now convey information to their communities. So uh, we also rolled out the radio, radio uh, messages, uh, rolled them out to the community and 
uh, implemented all the different um, IC materials we had uh, created. So as we conclude, uh, our take from this is that the CAP findings were useful in developing the IEC materials for social mobilization and uh, cre creation of awareness among the community. And uh, this intervention in terms of having a communication strategy plays or and becomes a key role in the contributing towards the 2030 WHO goal on heart elimination as a public health measure. So implementation of digital diagnostics need to take into consideration the wider socioeconomic and cultural contexts and engage the communities in their implementation. Because if we do not take into consideration the wider cultural context, these attitudes, the perceptions that exist, they may become barriers towards effective control of uh, the disease, and they would become barriers to also effective uptake and uh, use of the new diagnostics that we bring along. So even as I conclude and uh, uh, give acknowledgements to the various partners, uh, I'd, I'd like to say that uh, the information that we gathered from this study are useful even for future studies that are implementing digital diagnostics and even for the list wing, it's, it's, it's information that would be useful to take into consideration even as that is being rolled out. So thank you very much. And these are the partners of the Digital Diagnostic African Network also. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Salome. Uh, that was both your presentation and Laura's absolutely eye-opening. Um, I suppose we broadened the lens a bit, moving away from the very acutely technical side of digital diagnostics and really opening this up to the communities and the communication, the education effort. And that's really something that even the WHO, for example, have cemented in their new roadmap, really looking at putting local communities at the heart of interventions, but also encouraging all these very uh, new and cross-sectoral collaborations. So it was absolutely uh, eye-opening to hear all these, all this feedback and all this really particular insight into uh, communicate communities uh, across a huge number of diseases. So thank you very much both. And I suppose all this really points, um, it, it is about access in a broader sense. It's how do you improve that access to diagnostics all the way from the technology, all the way to the education, the communication side of things. Uh, so a huge amount of work there and opportunities. Uh, we've had, while you were speaking, quite a lot of questions pouring in from these sort of quite acute to the uh, broader discussions. And I suppose we we could start, um, first of all, by saying that you've had many uh, congratulations and thanks. Uh, Stephen Ott is saying here, I've enjoyed both presentations. Congratulations to both speakers. Uh, Francesca Piffer from the Digital Diagnostics Network is saying fantastic presentations and studies. Uh, we echo all of this, of course. Um, but perhaps moving on to the questions now, uh, we could start off going back to um, Laura and Kevin, your work. Uh, there was just a question here from Stephen Bremer, tuning in from Canada, and asking uh, what training facilities were available in your study area or Ethiopia as a whole, and were they equipped for digital diagnosis? Uh Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yep, yeah, we can hear you well. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so typically it is not us that um, provides the training. We partner with um, implementing partners. So for this study, we partnered with the Regional Health Bureau in Ethiopia to deliver the training. Um, and also we engage with sort of system level training as well. Um, so. Yeah, I hope I hope that answers your your question. Yeah, and and just to add to that, I think um, if if the question was around um, training for 
digital diagnostics, I think um, there's very little, you know, our research and the, the research that Laura presented shows that um, there's very little um, in the way of digital diagnostics being used in the network and in the system at the moment in Ethiopia for NTD. So I think, um, you know, there would be a huge amount of training being provided at the moment on that. But I think the key message here is that um, we need, as one of the other questions was about integration. I think we definitely need to see NTDs integrated into the health system and um, the existing health system in Ethiopia. And that will create a platform for testing um, exciting new digital platforms such as MLA Swing and others. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, I'm on. thought I was muted, sorry. Um, and I suppose that ties into Stephen Olt's question, which, who was asking uh, more specifically what type of devices are provided in the intervention for the improvement of digital-based diagnostics in Ethiopia. Um, is there a specific area or disease that you might be focusing on in the first instance? I can I can answer that, Laura, if you like. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it's a good question. I I, I feel like um, from from the results that we've seen uh, and from the formative research, um, the intervention that we 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 are currently testing is is um, quite basic, if you like. And um, and I think again, um, once we have the results from the the this. The testing of this intervention intervention and the evaluation of it i think we, we then will have a better understanding of um, where digital um, technologies would fit um, and what would be you know as you say what would be the quick wins perhaps around the introduction of digital diagnosis diagnostics um, and where in the health system they would best fit and um, so i think it's a little bit of way to see on that Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, turning to you, Salome, as a few questions about your work. Uh, first and foremost, um, again, a question from Stephen, who's very active in the chat. So hi, Stephen, and thank you for all your questions. Uh, Stephen's asking to expedite diagnosis uh, in the areas where that you were describing to us in your work. Why not test for both malaria and trypanosomiasis parasites initially? Uh, why not combine that? And I suppose in a broader sense, that might link to uh, Dr. Ivana haluskova Balcher's question, and this could go to all the panelists, um, which is about integrating the diagnosis of several NTDs uh, in prevention and health plans, not just with other NTDs, but perhaps also NCDs. How would digital diagnostics facilitate that? But first and foremost, um, Salome, did did you see any particular reasons for which um, not test malaria and HAT at the initial stages? Um, I'm not I'm not a very good expert in the RDTs, but I will try. Um, one of the things I think is because it, looking at the areas where uh, sleeping sickness is common, you find that uh, malaria is a very common ailment in, 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 in most of those areas. So uh, many people will, will present with febrile illnesses. And if you have to test for the sleeping sickness at the same time, then sometimes you, you, you'll be uh, spreading your RDT kits too thin across. So you'd rather conserve them for just those who you suspect have been treated for malaria but are not positive. But I think the direction that um, the author talks about, about the integration, maybe if, if, if there's the possibility of integrating uh, the diagnostic kit so that they're able to pick more than one if, if they are co-infections or, 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 uh, or that, maybe that would be a useful process. So from my lay perspective, that's what I can see. Fantastic. Uh, just to clarify here, a question by Stephen Old, and who's questioning the, who's asking a question around the term digital, uh, and a lot of the communication approaches that you described, Salome, were were not digital. They were actually quite um, 
you know, simple and traditional, whether it be a brochure, a flip chart, radio jingles and so forth. So those were not digital approaches. And I suppose in this context of this work and this webinar, the digital side applies to diagnostics only. And Stephen was asking, um, uh, how can digital diagnostics or digital technology in general aid in addressing these social behavioral issues? Uh, because there is no digital side to the communication. So is that something deliberate or because it works best or is it because this is still very much a um, a field and an area where there's a lot of work in progress? Uh, we've, uh, ISNTD certainly found that there's a lot of movement in these communication approaches for public health to the extent where we do an annual conference on this called ISNTD Festival. Uh, where we just, you know, really look in more detail about all these approaches. So in your opinion, Salome, what's the future of digital in the education and communication sides of things? Oh, you're back on mute. Sorry, Salome. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think the, 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 there's a great future in terms of uh, digital um, besides just digital diagnostics, but also digital technology in relation to conveying even information to the community. Um, what I must say is that the areas where the disease currently has been have been areas which are kind of uh, the infrastructure is not very uh, strong, is, is a bit poor. They're marginalized areas. So sometimes you find you're even in a place and you can't get network to even communicate on phone. And that becomes a challenge in terms of then implementing the digital aspects. You may want to use some of the digital uh, methods that we have, which, may, which are currently used even in urban areas where information is relayed through your phone. You find um, information on particular things are relayed to you to, through your phone and that helps to increase your knowledge you're able to access internet and get in, in and get more information there. But because most of these areas are rural areas with poor fast infrastructure, then that becomes a challenge. But I see uh, that then becomes the innovation. What are kind of the in innovations in terms of digital, digital aspects that we can uh, implement in such areas? So I think that's something we can think about as we move along, taking into consideration the infrastructure that exists in those areas. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and moving back to the digital diagnostics themselves, and here's a great question uh, from Gert van der Awera. And Gert was asking, hi Gert, by the way, and Gert was asking, how sustainable are digital diagnostics? Is it a defendable capacity building strategy? I'm thinking of lack of basic training, infrastructure, maintenance and supply problems. Um, again, I've put the link in the chat, but there's a fantastic kind of overview of this approach and the potential for it in one of our previous um, ICNTD Connects and also as part of our annual meeting on diagnostics. So by all means, anyone who hasn't seen that, please do take a moment to, to go view that. But back to our panelists today, what what is this a sustainable and defendable strategy to jump into digital diagnostics? I, I mean, I'm happy to um, address some of that um, from from our um, experience at Malaria Consortium, not specifically for um, the study that Laura presented today, but some of our other work, particularly in Mozambique, where we've introduced a decision support tool, a digital decision support tool, which um, supports community health workers to conduct um, the IMCI or follow the IMCI algorithm. Um, we've seen that um, this digital platform is really valuable um, at the community level and health workers who, who suffer from um, all of the challenges um, that we talked about around uh, lack of network and um, uh, you know, access to um, supplies and trainings and stuff, um, that the digital platform is still valuable. Um, and we have to obviously have the right technology, so therefore it needs to work on and offline. Um, but with, with those um, adaptions, which can be 
you know, built into the technology quite easily. Um, it really does support um, the health of the community health workers to conduct um, their their work. So I think there is a space for digital diagnostics. I think more and more we're seeing more platforms being introduced and tested. Um, I do, I agree that it needs to be sustainable and we need to have an integrated view. So we can't be providing 10 different digital tools, one for each vertical illness. It needs to be integrated and it, we need to work together to make it um, useful, sustainable and valuable um, and affordable. Um, so I think um, there's work to be done on that. But I, I definitely see the value and, and I think we will see more and more um, introduction, more and more introductions of, of, of uh, you know, innovative digital tools around diagnosis. Thank you very much. Laura, Salome, would you like to add to this? Um, just adding on to what Kevin has said, um, th there are steps that can be made to improve on these digital aspects. Uh, for example, I know in, um, in South Sudan, in the peripheral health facilities where uh, there was need to have electricity, uh, the organization uh, implemented aspects of using solar power to be able to power, uh, have power in those facilities. And those are some of the methods that can help digitalize even areas which have poor infrastructure by using some of the technology that exists um, to be able to provide maybe electricity and through that then one is able to access even other um, digital um, information on media. Uh, and and uh, given that um, slowly uh, in, in time also the infrastructure is being improved on, so we, we, can, we cannot say we cannot go digital, but because of that improvement in infrastructure, much as it may take time, then the future is still digital. So that's something that we need to then work towards. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Any ad, any additional comments? Um, no, no major additions. I think I think that digital diagnostics has such a huge potential. But you know, obviously, as the other two said, you know, we do need to consider things like cost, um, and particularly in these kind of rural, um, low-income settings. You know, is the infrastructure in place to train staff on digital diagnostics um, and use them. I, I was just thinking it popped into my mind earlier. I was reading about um, a device that was used to diagnose glaucoma, which is an eye condition. Um, and they had a, I think it was a mobile phone linked to a very a cheap, low cost um, device. And that enabled them to diagnose uh, glaucoma remotely. So I, I'm not a trachoma glaucoma expert, but I'm thinking, you know, in a setting like with our study where, you know, there are a lack of um, laboratory facilities um, to do the bacterial testing for trachoma um, and also perhaps where staff aren't trained or available to physically examine people for trachoma, that sort of low cost um, device might prove um, helpful. But again, this is something we definitely need to explore a little more, I think. Yeah. I think what really kind of springs to mind when you bring these issues up is that last slide on Salome's presentation with all the partners that are involved in a network such as the Digital Diagnostics for Africa network. Uh, I am not worried given the amount of partners that there is there are lots of people looking at this very carefully, lots of organizations, uh, both international organizations, also very local uh, organizations or charities who are involved in your exciting projects and really in uh, rolling out digital diagnostics in, in very challenging situations. So uh, already an amazing network. Do you feel maybe there are certain partners that could still come to the table who might be missing? Is this a kind of organization or a type of partner that you would like to see more of to help address the challenges that you've brought up uh, today in your presentations? 
And I don't just mean more money, more funders. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think it's a really good point. I do think that we need to see more industry and more um, technology development um, organizations working more closely with us. Um, we can't, we don't have those skills and we don't have those expertise. And I do feel like, um, you know, really the best um, innovation happens when the different partners bring their skill set to it. So we have the implementation expertise, we have the knowledge on the ground, but we don't have the technology expertise. So I think it'd be really great to see um, more tech um, heavy um, organizations joining. I'm joining this. Laura, I see you're agreeing with that. I'm agreeing with Kevin, but I have nothing to add. What about you, Salome? Yeah, I agree. I agree with Kevin and uh, would like to see more of the private sector also involved uh, because many times uh, they're not part of the they're not uh, many of them are not part of these uh, meetings or these networks. Uh, for example, uh, if I look at the Kenyan scenario, we would need to involve the private sector in relation to the mobile technology, because within that, then we'd be able to find maybe come up with solutions that can help um, reach these areas which are not so well resourced in terms of infrastructure. So, bringing in private sector is very key in terms of these partnerships. Yeah. Uh, there's a really interesting comment in the chat, actually, from uh, Dr. Aubrey Cunnington at Imperial College, who is one of the leads on the Digital Diagnostics for Africa network. Um, Aubrey writes, Salome has made a really good point about mobile connectivity and uh, the network has partnered with Jangala, a charity working on enhancing the use of existing mobile networks to expand connectivity. And that's probably a really exciting example of a charity uh, liaising with those industry partners um, that you are mentioning. So um, lots of ways to get to that part, but to get to that outcome. Um, but yes, yeah, so we hear you loud and clear, more industry partners. Uh, would be fantastic. We had a question from my colleague, Cameron Rafiq, a colleague here at ISNTD, who's asking, should we be pushing, so from an advocacy perspective, should we be pushing for the digital diagnostics innovations to be part of national integrated disease surveillance programs or networks? Has enough been done uh, kind of on an advocacy level for, for this? Yeah, I mean, I well, think, uh, sorry, go ahead. All right, I, I, I was going to say that I think that's a very brilliant suggestion. And uh, of course, th there could be some work already happening, but not at a very large scale. I think there's need to advocate more. Uh, so that even within the country surveillance system, that is something that's um, well incorporated, uh, not just in the, the mainstream health facilities, but goes all the way even to the local level. Because sometimes you'd find the digital surveillance may be, in, may be the more upstream health facilities, but there's need to strengthen that aspect even at the lower levels. So over to you, Kevin. Thanks, Lomi. I think that's the, those are great points and, and mirror what I was going to say. I think um, we've seen loads of um, innovation around digital surveillance, but as you say, um, we need to think about sustainability. So it's like, how do we ensure that it's embedded into the system? How do we support it and, and um, uh, you know, ensure the, that the long-term use of, of the platforms? So I think those are definitely the things that we need to um, focus on and get our heads around how best we can ensure that um, all this great technology is used um, to the best uh, of everyone's ability over the long term. That's a really good point, Kevin, and thank you as well, Salome. It leads really nicely into the next question. 
uh, from Francesca Piffer, also a member of the Digital Diagnostics uh, for Africa Network. And Francesca was asking, which are the qualitative methods to best assess the feasibility and sustainability, acceptability and affordability of a health intervention or new technology? So kind of moving away from just digital diagnostics, um, what are have you found to be the best qualitative methods to assess um, these innovations? And are they different for different stakeholders? Um, I can have a crack at that. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you have, you know, focus group discussions and key informant interviews, which I guess in, in our case, you could do with the staff, um, using the diagnostic tools or the new technology, but also among the patients who are receiving their diagnosis. Um, a thing we did um, in one of our other studies at Malaria Consortium, we were testing a geospatial um, platform that was used by community health workers in the field to plan which households they were going to visit. Um, it wasn't a diagnostic tool, it was more of a, a planning um, platform, but we use something called a think aloud methodology um, as part of uh, usability testing. So we took the community health workers and we asked them to perform specific tasks within that platform. Um, and while they were doing the tasks, we would ask them to think out loud and describe what they were doing, how they were doing it. Um, and this was being noted by data collectors who were present. So that kind of gave us an insight into maybe not so much sustainability, um, but kind of usability, how useful is the, is the technology and you know how efficient it, is it? Does it speed up their tasks or does it slow them down? Um, and so, yeah, I guess a bit of feasibility as well. Um, yeah, I, I would say that, that's my input. Fantastic. Kevin, would you um, like to add to this at all? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I agree. I think um, those um, those methods that um, Laura um, highlighted are, are super important um, because I think we need to engage with the users um, in a meaningful way to capture the data that we need. So in using those kind of participatory methods, we can get quickly to the really important um, data that we need um, around usability. Um, so it, uh, it allows the, the users to really understand and, and, and provide data on, on the key points. So is, is the button in the right place? Is, is it uh, in an intuitive color? Do I understand the readout? All of that through that those um, those uh, uh, participatory methods, I think it really helps to gather that rich data that's important from a usability perspective. So yeah, I think I think we definitely have seen that over a number of studies, and, and uh, would recommend those. Yeah. Fantastic, Salome. Yeah, I think just echoing what Laura and Kevin has said the participatory methods are quite um, good in terms of helping assess community acceptance of various uh, diagnostics, their preference over one over the other. So it's a whole basket of tools within the qualitative methods that are important to use more from that participatory approach perspective, because that would help us then gauge exactly what the community is thinking about these uh, diagnostic kits their preferences and uh, the, the, the barriers that they have, they face in terms of uh, accepting those um, or utilizing those methods. And those then help us to step back and see how can we improve on even our delivery of these uh, diagnostic kits. Yeah. So the whole range of the qualitative participatory methods are important. Mm -hmm. Do you find uh, perhaps that there could be a lot of lessons learned from uh, another field where the communities or the public has quite a lot of experience in, and that would be 
gaming and social media um, in terms of user experience and so forth, it seems that side of industry is often very open to um, uh, assisting other spheres, including public health. And I was just wondering if um, there had been any kind of studies or partnerships that you'd heard of where, where some of those lessons could be in included uh, for something uh, like the adoption of digital diagnostics or just on, on the design side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, we've, we have, uh, we work with a, an AI partner who has created some groups to validate their, their tools through various stages in the design. So they, um, create um, a particular um, use case and then um, um, open that up to typically groups of medical students or whatever to validate um, that particular use case. So that's quite interesting where they're um, using that kind of crowd, I don't know the terms, I don't know the terms I'm afraid, but whatever the term is, a group of people testing their, um, testing the tool online. Um, and, uh, and and they they find that super useful. So it's a group of, I suppose, uh, potential users because they're medical students or whatever. And then and they they run they ask them to use the tool and then have a, a, a kind of an online questionnaire that they fill out about the experience they've had. Um, and they and they found that very useful in the design process of their of their um, of their devices. Yeah. So maybe that's something similar to what you were suggesting. And Salome, would would any of this uh, help it to fill some of the gaps that you've uncovered? Well, the, 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 that's an interesting perspective, which would be worth exploring, especially given that uh, when you look at the gaming, there are people who are quite into it so much. So if we could uh, learn from from that and see what is it. But of course, then there's all the whole range of other things that we need to take into consideration. The motive behind why people are involved in gaming may be different from the motive that we have when we want to implement a health aspect in it. But uh, definitely there are lessons we can also pick out that we can use and adopt um, to, towards uh, the diagnostics. Yeah, over to you. Laura, anything you'd like to, to add to this? Um, nothing in particular to add. It's a, it's a very interesting idea that I hadn't really thought of before. Um, I'm not aware of any sort of partnerships uh, happening, but um, yeah, I think it would be, would be good to explore. Yeah, definitely. Right, watch this space. <laughs> Um, I suppose to kind of bring our discussions towards a conclusion. So we have heard a lot of the gaps that you've identified and thank you so much. And it's been really interesting to hear all these lessons learned, I suppose, not just for digital diagnostics, but for our very broad and varied um, audience in public health and particularly NTDs. Uh, some really fascinating insights into communities and into some of the barriers that might be met by anyone um, trying to introduce a technology or an innovation. But in terms of your own work and your projects, what um, what should we look out for next? And what are your own personal next steps or as part of the group? Is there something specific that you'd like to focus on and develop in future? So I, I think from the Malaria Consortium side, we're we're super excited to um, move to the evaluation of the intervention, um, and and then quite quickly think about um, what that means for digital diagnos diagnostics. So, um, you know, really understanding um, how um, NTDs can be best managed at um, the primary healthcare level, and then. Um, what can we do to um, improve that even further using digital diagnostics, et cetera? So I think that's super interesting. Yeah, 
Yeah, so um, from my side, um, talking from a social science perspective, um, it's, it's more about kind of, uh, I wouldn't call it advocating, but maybe uh, partnering more with the biomedical scientists uh, to be able to help um, improve on that community engagement aspect, even within the, um, the technology aspects. So just providing that social science context that is useful towards the effective um, adoption and delivery of diagnostics. Yeah, so it's, just, it's more about the partnerships. Yeah. Absolutely. And I suppose in terms of you mentioned the word partnerships um, and uh, on the educational level with the communities, but also uh, Stephen Bremer's highlighting here and asking, is it necessary to incorporate digital diagnosis into the educational curricula in both developed and developing nations? So partnerships across sectors and particularly with the education communication sector, but on on every level. And do you see that um, happening quite easily with, in terms of the uh, educational and training curricula? Um, what I see now, there's a lot of, uh, for example, if I look at the University of Nairobi, there's a lot of partnerships with various institutions, with various universities, academic research, academicians and, and, and uh, research organizations. So I think already there's that opportunity that exists, which then is just for now the partners to leverage on that, to be able to then achieve that objective. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think as well, you know, uh, these these um, groups and these um, networks and, and um, partnerships are really important. So I think more and more we should be seeing, you know, we've talked a bit about how the different members of, of the partnership groups can bring their skill sets. So whether it's private sector or um, tech companies or academics or ourselves in NGOs, we all have something, some part to play. So I think it's it's amazing to see these groups come together um, and we should do this more and more. I think that it's it's the the right kind of um, uh, platform for um, developing and introducing new technologies. Fantastic, thank you. And I suppose when we last question, when we look at all this uh, multi partner, multi sectoral collaboration, that also strengthens the case for funding for digital diagnostics and uh, in terms of the future of funding for digital diagnostics, do you see this in a very positive light? Um, what are some of the avenues that could be explored or partnerships in order to secure that all important funding, perhaps attaching this or putting it in a broader context of sustainable development or the WHO's own roadmap goals? Um, do you, where do you see the the kind of building blocks for the funding um, coming from? Um, I think we've seen the introduction of and pilot testing of lots of new technologies. I think um, there's a little, what, what we need to ensure is that we're um, now demonstrating the sustainability and the impact of digital technologies. So I do think that we, need to have um we need to work together to develop robust evaluations of digital technologies so we can show impact outcomes and and how these digital technologies actually improve health outcomes are cost effective and sustainable so i think we need to i think if you know donors may be a little bit um uh a little bit um, slow to fund more and more pilots of digital technologies and, and we need to um, understand how we can um, best work together to um, scale and evaluate um, so that we can show that they are sustainable for the long term. So. Yes, I, I can also add, add to that and say I think there's also a lot around 
inclusive um, technology, technology that's um, accessible to an inclusive uh, community so that we have the gender and inclusivity aspects also ingrained within the technology. So um, I've seen quite some funding in the field of gender and inclusivity and incorporating also the AI component in it, building up technology that would be inclusive for most of the community is I think a key area which we can be looking at. And uh, also that aspect of uh, technology that is able to meet several of the sustainable development goals would also be quite key in terms of the approach uh, uh, that we take as we move along. Yeah, so over to you, thank you. And Laura, any... Uh Anything to add to this? Where where will this next round of funding come from? Um, not too sure about funding. I guess I can kind of echo what the other two said. I think for me, it's very easy to say, you know, digital diagnostics is the future. It must be better than what we currently have because it's innovative and new. Um, so I guess kind of repeating what Kevin said, I think, uh, it's it, we shouldn't get too carried away and it's important to you know in our studies at malaria consortium and elsewhere really like ingrain robust evaluations to really see if they are having an impact on health outcomes um and whether they it is a worthwhile investment wonderful well um this session's been really really exciting i think it was it's been very refreshing but I at the time gave us a lot of food for thought to move away slightly from the hugely innovative approaches that are within the digital diagnostics technologies and to really think about um, very varied and different issues. I mean, we've spoken about uh, just a few seconds ago, everything from inclusivity to education, of course, communities, how to uh, communicate with stakeholders and really front load all those things into the development of a technology rather than consider them as an afterthought. So I think that's been a really interesting uh, exercise in trying to rethink product development and public health interventions. So for all that, um, we just wanted to really thank you. And we're extremely grateful to the three of you for your time today and for uh, opening up all these issues. Uh, Roleo Emmanuel is writing here, greatly insightful um, session. Uh, Roleo tuning in from Kaduna in Nigeria, from the Nigerian Institute for Trypanosomiasis and Onchocerciasis Research. And I think most of our attendees would um, echo that. So a huge thank you. Uh, to be continued, definitely. I think there's yet much um, more to unpack here as we we follow all these fantastic and varied partners working together to bring uh, this very complex approach um, to fruition on top of it in resource poor um, uh, areas and communities. On a practical level, this session is part of a bigger session, a series of sessions with the Digital Diagnostics for Africa Network. So please do, by all means, uh, look out for further announcement for our next sessions. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to thank you once again, thank our speakers, thank our attendees, uh, to everyone who came here together, and uh, we've learned a lot from everyone. So a huge thank you. And from us, we wish you all the best until our next session. And by all means, let's definitely keep in touch. If you have any more questions for our speakers, please don't hesitate to send them in. And hopefully we can continue these discussions at our next session. Thanks very much. So thank you all and take care and hope to see you very soon again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your work. Thanks so much. Goodbye. Yeah, you're welcome. Take care.